actually did not lie with, in many ways, what is the dominant political partner, the Kingdom of Poland. Scotland, in 1603 and 1707, was bloody poor. Hordes of very poor noblemen came south. One of the great problems with the Union of Lublin is that the execution of the law with regard to royal estates was not extended to Lithuania or to the Ukrainian lands that were incorporated into Crown Poland. That meant a great deal. It made defense of the realm very difficult because the monies went to the wealthy nobility, the great magnates who formed and had great cultural patronage power, the Radzivil, the Sapieha, the Wisniewiecki, the Ostrowski, and that was a system, they like, and this is tied up with what were to one of the problems with the development of Cossackdom is something that Frank showed years ago that in the Ukrainian Palatinates, the difference between the nobility and the rest, the nobility in the Kiev Palatinate was much smaller than it was in the rest of Poland. 1% of the population compared with 6, 8, 25% in Mazovia where everybody was a noble and everybody was poor which meant that those excluded from this great new citizenship, their status was uncertain. And actually what goes on after 1569 in Ukraine, in what is now Ukraine, is as much a struggle between the great laws. Now you can call them Poles, they weren't Poles. Or some of them were because they could get land in these territories after the Union. A lot of them were native Ruthenians who either did become Catholics or didn't become Catholics. Now that's one of the power of the identity. You can't say, you know, yes, you can have Nazione Polonus Gens Rutenus or Roxolanus or whatever you want to say. And that really did operate with people like Czartoryski. But it's not the same as saying, I'm British or Sarmatian. Sarmatian was just an origin myth. Sorry, that's but rather long. But to get to your question, um, I have no idea how this can help modern Ukrainian nationhood. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to say you can't explain what goes on here in terms of assuming certain assumptions about a Ukrainian nation that existed then. The Ukrainian nation emerged as the result of a process. We historians are very good now about talking about the process of nation formation and building, yet frequently when it comes to politics we go back and assume there was the same Ukrainian nation in 1569 as there is today or there was then. Um, Part of my appeal to Ukrainian historians is to go back and write about Rus as a totality and not just say, well, that lot are Belarusian up there, we're not going to write about them. Because Rus, Ruthenians at the time taking part in the politics of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, of Litva, um, they believed in Rus. And they didn't think it ended where the Union of Lublin drove the, the border accidentally. Mozir becomes part of the Grand, or remains part of the Grand Duchy because Radzivil Rudy happens to be its starosta and Sigismund August doesn't want to cause him any more trouble than he's having anyway. Um, the, the nation emerges out of the, this, but that's, the national divides clearly are determined in very large part by the border put within Rus by um, Lublin, but that's not the border they're concerned with. They actually want more. They want Brest and further north in some of the Ruthenian proposals in 1569. They want to extend Rus that joins the crown, but they don't get away with that. That doesn't happen. But they are thinking in terms of Rus. By the time that Frank was talking about in the 18th century, yes, Ukraine has now become a concept. And as he showed this morning, it's on the left bank. It's on the part that's no longer in the Commonwealth. But as regards this, I'm rather with the Polish critics of volumes three to six of the great history who say, you can talk about Ukraine in the 15th century, but we're not going to because it's Rus, and we don't think this term is valid. Um, Okay, uh, Frank, th uh, s thanks for this comment. It is very interesting in, in a sense that uh, it's, it's how we construct our lives and our experiences and what is Im most important for them. Of course, 
Shevchenko and Hritsak were refugees, World War II refugees, but uh, again, judging by what you're saying, conceptualized their lives in, 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 in a wake of a different type of a major event and catastrophe. Uh, what I was thinking also about lumping together um, Dashkevich, Isayevich on the one hand, and Shevchenko and, and Pritsak and maybe some others on the other, is that both Dashkevich and uh, Isayevich uh, at the end of their lives certainly deal very much with World War II and with World War II memories, e either in their, in, in, in their writings or in the position of the directors of the two institutions. When this doesn't happen in North America. And I wonder, uh, again, uh, whether this is true or not, but, but the question of the fact that intellectuals are outside of their societies whether that makes it easier to, to build bridges and, 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 and talk about that, or being part of the society and the discourse and the loyalties that are there really, really uh, make this more difficult. Because I don't think that once, uh, especially say, yeah, which one he moves into, in, in, into World War II issues, uh, there are many more bridges built with his Polish counterparts than were before. It, it, my impression is that it's, uh, less, so. But again, it's 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 a broader question of of being be, being part of the, the 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 society or being outside of the society. What makes you freer and 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 better positioned to 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 engage in dialogue and continue the dialogue? Uh, just a, uh, a little bit um, double ident identity. I think, uh, um, but it is possible, uh, even in uh, 19th century. I, I couldn't agree with uh, with you, and I think that that uh, there is a difference between what uh, you are thinking about you yourself and what uh, how people uh, perceived uh, your position. So uh, thinking about Sheptitsky is different uh, uh, when uh, uh, the Poles are, are talking about him, and especially in the um, t uh, interwar period, uh, accusing him, or uh, for example, his mother is also a, a good example, how she perceived his uh, attitude as a traitor, yes? And uh, I think that it is a principle of exclusion, yes? Uh, and, uh, uh, but I have no problem with identity, for example. I could be also uh, uh, Ukraine as well, Ukrainian as, as Paul, and uh, it is no problem for me. Excellent. On that note, I think we might have to end the discussion. Um, but do remember the discussion will continue in 20 minutes' time when we have a roundtable session. Uh, but please join me in thanking our excellent panel. <laughs>
chairs to the side because they, they were going to basically run things from here, weren't they? Yeah. I'll show you. turn is still in play as well just so they've got one mic floating around just so you know
streaming that if I am streaming. So, um, yeah, not much else to be said really, apart from throw some people might come up and offer you Thanks very much.
Okay, so I've lost now two CF card cases and me being me, I'm going to obsess about it and constantly look for them around the room all day and it's going to drive me mad. Um, that sounds remarkably good. Um, let me know when you're happy, otherwise I'll just jibber, 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 jibber. Jibber, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Right, okay. Well, I mean, to my ear, selfishly sitting underneath the donut over here, over the overhang, it actually sounds reasonable, considering. Um, there's actually quite a lot of fabric in this room. I just noticed that these were all fabric, kind of baffly bits. So, it could be worse. So then, number two. Now, when we get some presenters back in the room, if we double team it in as much as I'll sit there and whiz through, are you gonna need to be at the desk? Do you want me to just bung one? Don't take me a second. No trime at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Checker, checker, checker. One, two, one, two. Not speaking particularly loudly. Maybe I should project my voice a little bit just to annoy you. Does that work any better? Okay.
for the project's purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you if we're going to buy any individual. Yeah, I will. No, I'll. I'll, 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 I'll that's I will fine. Pay, I'll buy you. I'll buy you. No, of course, I'm buying it for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you give me, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a deal on it because it's a bit, it's a bit knocked about, and then I don't have to carry it back up to Aberdeen. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying, and I would yeah. love to go. We'll have yeah. it back for our years. Yeah. What do I do with this? I, I put it in my pocket. Oh, what are they? Two authors' copies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got two. No, I, I, I gave one to Olenka. Yeah. I got, I got a few authors' copies, but I, they were quite generous actually. But yeah. I sent them to people yeah, that I needed. I just said I, I go to Munich for a few days and then I go back. What do we, oh, we put it. We're working on yeah. the five and we want the people to come out with the same thing. Well, uh, yeah, and I will, I mean, I will obviously make reference to it in the, in volume four. Right, there we go. So what do you do, you? That's all. Then down there, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this experiment in live streamed roundtabling, uh, otherwise known as Rory and Stanley play talk show hosts for uh, an hour or so. Um, it's a delight to have you here. It's a very great pleasure for us and a great honor to have uh, the assembled on this stage um, this afternoon. What we'd like to do is have, again, a very informal and fluid discussion. There have been a, a, a number of themes and issues and, and uh, uh, very pregnant, profound questions being asked today about reconciliation, about the function of history in contemporary Polish-Ukrainian relations. Uh, so we have a lot to discuss, and um, we want to enable um, all of you to have uh, an opportunity to participate. We'll also be joined by um, numerous colleagues and um, individuals on, online who will be uh, sending questions and participating in the discussion as well. Um, so uh, again, we'll keep it fluid and open-ended. I want to begin with uh, a question posed by um, a great colleague of ours, Mark von Hagen, who is professor of history at Arizona State University. Um, he sadly could not be here, but wanted to make sure he was here, not only in spirit, but also uh, in conversation with you. And he asked the following question. What have the political and intellectual elites of Poland and Ukraine learned from 20th century histories? To what degree have Poles transcended Pilsudski's ideas about Ukraine's place in Poland's history? And to what degree have Ukrainians proved capable of transcending their historical mistrust of the Poles? Um, since uh, it's a challenge to know to whom to direct a question like that, given that it's a, a very big one. I'm going to um, just err on the side of proximity and ask Mikola Garabchuk to attempt an answer to, to get the conversation started. Mikola? Well, uh, I wouldn't uh, respond for uh, Polish elite because I, uh, <laughs> I don't belong and I don't want to, to take this you know, piece of bread from my uh, Polish colleagues. Uh, as to uh, Ukrainians, um, I feel that <coughs> In this regard, Ukraine is, uh, is very different because we have. Uh, in this case, I would I hope that Yaroslav uh, Rusak wouldn't 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 uh, oppose me. In this case, we really have two Ukraines because we have one part where uh, Pol Pol Polish-Ukrainian conflicts and problems is not an issue, uh, and uh, the other part where it's really hot topic still is a hot topic. Mm. Uh, because it's still it's still a part of, of family memory and, and so on. I mean, in, in Western Ukraine, uh, so of course, uh, of course, perception is very different. Uh, I would say that um, in major part of Ukraine, uh, Poland is just a neighbor, uh, or maybe their neighbor because it's the most visible neighbor, which neighbor which is uh, 
present in mass media, which has very positive coverage. It's really a role model for, for Ukraine reforms. Uh, so surprisingly, uh, despite even very influential, very powerful Russian uh, anti-Polish propaganda, anti-Western mm. propaganda, and Polish is part of it, uh, it doesn't work uh, in Ukraine. I haven't noticed uh, anything like this, either in Kharkiv or Odessa. Uh, it's, it's really not, uh, did not influence uh, opinion. Uh, Poland is perceived very, very positively, uh, uh, as if there was no, you know, Taras Bulba studied in school and, and, and so on. Uh, in West Ukraine, it's different, uh, of course, uh, because uh, there is memory, uh, very personal memory, I feel, because it's, it's trans transferred from grandparents to, to children, and, and the main narrative is, of course, of uh, humiliation. They did not treat us as human beings. Mm. This is a typical, typical response mm. uh, when you ask about Poles, uh, they, they say. So uh, whatever, uh, well, they may have good relations. They go to Poland and they have friends or colleagues or business partners, but still there's some sort of, uh, if you ask about the past, they have this you know, very, very, very bad, uh, very bad memory. Mm. Um, which is, I notice it's not recognized properly in Poland. Mm. It's main, maybe main, uh, main rift in our perceptions. Uh, even Polish intellectuals, they, well, technically speaking, they, they can understand this, but it's not, it's not an issue in Poland. Uh, it's not as, as high issue as Volynia mm -hmm. massacre. Mm -hmm. Even though these uh, things are very interconnected, I believe you cannot understand one event without the other event. You cannot understand, uh, like, you know, uh, terrorism without, you know, these illegal settlements in the, um, and so on. Um, so, um, so yes and no. I I, I feel that uh, we we learned a lot, and uh, of course uh, um, there is very very deep understanding that cooperation is needed. It's kind of uh, strategic decision uh, in both societies and, and broadly supported. Mm, but still, there are some resentments, and um, it's also a very long story. It would last for mm. for years. And we never, I, I personally, I, uh, from all my experience, I don't, uh, I don't believe that we were never fully 100% agree on everything. You know, we still would have some, even if we agree, we still have some uh, yes, but. You know, we, we, prof as professionals, we can agree on almost on everything, uh, on facts. Facts are, facts are hard. And of course, it's easy to, no, not easy, but it's, uh, it's possible. But interpretation all the time is uh, ambiguous. And uh, I notice that we, even with the closest friends, we cannot uh, fully, 100% agree on, uh, on some hot issues. Mm -hmm. Still, there is this uh, yes, but. Mm -hmm. Yes, but. but is, there are some nuances. And in nuances, in details, we differ. In speaking of details, I failed to, of course, introduce our panelists very briefly uh, to the audience. And this is kind of a, a version of yes, but. Yes, I'm going to start this panel, but I should probably introduce everyone uh, as well. Uh, Mikhail, uh, Mikola Rabchuk is joined here on the stage by Pavel Koval, uh, Swalomir Serekovsky, uh, Johanna petrovsky stern Karolina Vigora, Uyin Blacker, Frank Sisson, and Robert Frost. Uh, again, thank you for your participation. Would anyone like to... Can, add to Mikola's comments. Again, about uh, Mark von Hagen's question about have uh, Polish and Ukrainian elites learned anything from this past and what has been learned, if anything? Johanna. Um, I will start uh, with a disclaimer. I need to say that I cannot say we, the Ukrainians, or we, the Poles. Uh, I have this privilege of not belonging to uh, any part of this conference. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, number one. Number two, I'm the least uh, politically correct person uh, at Northwestern campus, so uh, I, I might be saying things that uh, fly in the face of uh, some of the ideas we discussed today. So having said that, um, I would ask a question to a question, as Jews usually do. Um, uh, why not? Uh, the, the, my point is uh, very simple. When we talk about elites who are learning from uh, the experiences of one another, let's say Polish elite and, uh, elites and, and uh, Ukrainian elites, I would like to ask two specific questions. What kind of elites and when? Um, this is an important question, uh, whether we look, for example, um, uh, through the period of uh, 1960s, 19, 1980s um, in Ukraine and in Poland. And if we look, for example, at what is going on in the 1990s and over the last 15 years, um, we will see important um, 
parallels and important differences. Um, there is also a difference between, a, ma a major difference between the elites, let's say, in Krakow and in Warsaw, and the elites in Lviv and in Kiev. Mm -hmm. um, oh, th there are different perceptions of how these elites participate in the construction of national narrative, how these elites see themselves and their role in the construction of these narratives, and, and of course, uh, the level of uh, uh, nationalistic discourse or, let's say, liberal democratic discourse uh, also differs uh, in these elites. If you look, for example, at what is going on um, within uh, the elite, within the groups of uh, intellectuals, I don't know if they can be represented as self-aware uh, self elites, um, in uh, Lviv, let's say, Kharkiv, uh, Kiev, and Odessa, uh, in, in the um, last 25, 30 years of the Soviet Union, um, I, I, would, I would say that uh, elites in Kharkiv and Odessa do not care what the relations are really about. Um, elites in Lviv and Kiev are all the time pondering what these um, uh, relations, Polish-Ukrainian relations, are all about. Uh, for uh, Ukrainians, for Ukrainian elites uh, in Lviv, uh, we can talk about Dashkevich uh, and, and his circle, uh, Isayevich, um, and, and uh, you know this group of people. They certainly represent the Ukrainian self-aware elite, and uh, they are looking at Poland as at a at an example of uh, national democratic building of of the society and of the state. Uh, for uh, people in Kiev, uh, the uh, the national building project is secondary, but the survival, cultural survival, and suffering is number one. Um, it, uh, their discourse and their conversation, I would say, you know, Vadim Skuratyevsky, uh, Andrei Biletsky, Yuri Shcherbak, and others, for them, uh, what's going on in Ukrainian-Polish dialogue is very much mediated by the uh, Kiev-based perception of Russian literature and poetry. And in Russian literature and poetry, especially among the dissidents, the Polish question is the question of suffering. Um, I can give examples. I would not go into that. But this difference uh, of the perception of the dialogue between you know, national building project and suffering uh, is very important if we talk about the difference of perception by different elites uh, of that question. Mm -hmm. uh, to add something for the Polish side, um, I would say that it's uh, um, actually very hard to refer to this Piłsudski, who, who was in, a, in this question. There was no Gedrz, but this, this was mm -hmm. there was Piłsudski, which is, which is very interesting. Um, because it's very hard to, be, because with these borders, referring to Piłsudski doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. um, however, previous borders were a loss of Piłsudski, not a win, of course. Um, but, uh, but what is interesting is that um, before, with and, and with before Gedroj, who uh, Piłsudski represented the left side of Polish political scene, and on the other side was Endecja, and of course Endecja originally was pro-Russian, for the ethnic uh, Pol Polish country, so with the uh, for, for actually for a smaller uh, uh, Polish state. What happened after Riga? Was something which was like a f like a bad compromise between these two philosophies. What is what is what is different now is that Piłsudski actually represents rather the right wing side. Well, well, one thing is I'm talking about elites because I think Piłsudski would be much stronger in the s in the society as more romantic, paternalistic vision of like more colonial vision of. Of, of Poland, that's what I guess, that's what I think, how it works in the, in the, in the masses. But as for elites, Piłsudski is rather the, 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 um, the, the patron of the right side, how, and the Gedrich is a patron of the, of, the, of the left side, or like liberal side. But, but, but the, the, the truth is that actually Gedrich rules over entire political scene. I mean, it's very hard to find any efficient alternative to to Gedroch. And Piłsudski rather refers, to, uh, I'm talking more about sentiments than about concrete political philosophy or doctrine. Polish foreign policy doctrine begins with Gedroch. This is the first point of any political doctrine of any party in Poland before last elections. Now we had some, 
some new crazy politicians, and this is this is a bit different thing. But uh, but the general consensus has the face of Gedruj. If I may add uh, some words uh, <coughs> during the presentation, Karina Vigura, I thought that in fact uh, Pol Polish approach to Ukraine it's still governed by two coffins, of course. Uh, Piłsudski and uh, Domowski. In fact, in my opinion, we cannot do diverse for left and uh, left and right uh, wings. Uh, we, <coughs> in fact, should interpret the current approach to Ukraine crisis. Uh, particularly in the context of uh, Polish internal policy, in the general line uh, of uh, political of political uh, discussions uh, from last 100 years, and in fact, in fact, we have one interpretation, one approach. It's a uh, uh, it's an approach uh, based on the. Uh, insur insurrectionary, uh, insur insurrectionary um, tradition. It's an approach based on the Piłsudski tradition. Uh, and the second, it's a uh, index pro-Russian. And we can't find the different approaches, for example, in Polish right-wing uh, part of political scale. Really interesting was uh, the discussion uh, between, uh, between columnists of two right-wing weekly, uh, Wsieci and Dorzeczy, which was, uh, which was, uh, which was, uh, 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 which was explained by, by, by Karina Vigura. And we can observe in uh, right part of political skein and also in left uh, part of political skein completely different approaches. For example, uh, part of uh, intellectuals and uh, columnists of right wing will support more critical approach to Ukraine they will uh, they will underline uh, historical problems they will underline they, they they will ask about today for example they will ask about effectivity of uh, polish uh, of, of polish ukrainian relations and we will find on the right part of political scheme completely different meaning completely different interpretation of situation like, for example, Bronisław Wilstein, which uh, uh, will uh, mm, interpret the situation in the line of uh, uh, uprising tradition, in the line of uh, uh, Piłsudski tradition, solidarity tradition, etc., etc. And it's interesting that the same situation we have, for example, in approach to the um, war surprising, to the Russian imperialism, the same, uh, the same uh, published, the, the, the same uh, columnist, the same intellectual will uh, parallel sup support uh, Ukraine, and they will for uprising. The second, and uh, another. Uh, in the uh, Andic tradition, will support more critical approach to Warsaw Uprising, uh, more critical approach to uh, to Ukraine, um, and I think that if we want to understand uh, internal Polish internal discussion about Ukraine today we should use that cliche, that historical cliche. It could be more effective than, for example, to look for uh, political orientation. If I can just uh, react to 
that. Um, I believe we, we have to state at the very beginning that even the Polish attitude um, towards the Ukrainians within the last two years, so from the beginning of 2013, uh, the crisis of U the Ukrainian crisis at the end of 2013 until today, it is, it is not a stable space of time, it is also a process. So, so basically during the first year of, of the Ukrainian conflict, you could see a vast consensus in the Polish public sphere from left to the right, um, which was, which was um, uh, uh, articulated in support for Ukrainian democratic revolution. It is an interesting, Pavel, by the way, that, um, for example, the, uh, the uprising, the word uprising, was actually used in Gazeta Wyborcza and Rzeczpospolita. Mm -hmm. Equally, th this was very interesting. Why it was interesting? For two reasons. First reason is that political debate or public debate in Poland is extremely polarized between the, what we can call the conservative uh, rightist and leftist liberal, if we would like to generalize like that. Um, so, so this was a very big surprise, this, this, this year of consensus. What was also interesting is that Ukrainian crisis, 2013-2014, um, was in Poland the 25th year of Polish democratic, um, the, the, the Polish um, uh, the, the democracy. And what was here interesting is that after a very critical debate that we had about the Third uh, Republic of Poland in June, July, basically when the anniversaries were there, we had, um, we had uh, this, this consensus in the, in the debate about Ukraine and it seemed that everybody from left to the right are wishing Ukrainians one thing, to repeat the Polish success. So even though they were very critical about the Polish, uh, the, 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 the Polish uh, the, the democracy, the democratic system, the economical system and so, and so on, in the end, eventually they would say, but we wish the Ukrainians so, so, that, we so that they have the same, the same success. And I think it's very interesting. Um, now I think that um, much has been changing also in 2015. I haven't done such a, a, a vast query in the press periodicals uh, as, as with, with in, in the case of the first year, but I do believe that now the polarization is, is much more visible, but also perhaps because the subject itself has vastly vanished from the public debate. It is not as present as it was for the first year. For the, for, for the first year of Ukrainian crisis, you really had Ukrainian national colors on the pages of, of newspapers, and this was, it was on the first side of, of the dailies for months and months and months. Now, um, I would just like to, to also to react to Rory's question, um, and I would also like to, 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 answer, uh, uh, to ask a counter question. Um, why should we think that, that the, the, the perception of the elites is so important? I do believe that reconciliation is not about the elites because it is done by the elites. So the Polish and German elites, for example, has been, have been reconciled for many decades before there was something like a change in, do, in both societies. And I do believe it's just the same with the Polish and Ukrainian societies. The elites are completely reconciled. There is no question. The question is about the social awareness. And, and when we ask about the, the social perceptions of Ukrainians among the Poles, um, we, were, we have been discussing this uh, after our panel uh, in the morning, and we were trying to, to describe what the, the picture of a typical Ukrainian in Polish um, awareness would be. And I, thought, I think it would be a patchwork, a patchwork of new knowledge about a society that has changed profoundly and a society that has now uh, this beautiful generation of young people that are more educated than any other generation. This is something uh, about uh, what uh, Jarosław Hrycak had <coughs> written and said many times. But on the other hand, you also have this uh, paternalistic thought 
of uh, Ukrainian nationalists or even fascists. I, I, I would like to quote one, uh, one thing from, from Rzeczpospolita, this is a centrist, uh, centrist writer daily. Um, one of the commentators has written, um, I do know Ukraine very well, it's a beautiful country. It looks like a beautiful uh, girl with, uh, with uh, hair of the color of wheat. But the problem is the rain. The rain has come and her makeup has faded away. <laughs> this is something, I would have to check that. Um, th this is something that, that is really, uh, so, uh, this tells a lot about, y yes, yes. Uh, th this says a lot about the, the patchwork style of thinking of Ukrainians by Poles. Um, and, and perhaps one more thing. Uh, I also looked in the CEBOS, this is the center of, of, of um, research on the public opinion in Poland, and it shows that it's, it's very, it's very uh, complicated. On one hand, um, during the two years, 2013 uh, and 14, uh, the, uh, the attitude of Poles towards the Ukrainians has, has, um, has um, became um, uh, very good as for the relations between Poland and uh, Ukraine. So many, many, many Poles have said, yes, the relations have improved a lot. But as for if we like Ukrainians, the Ukrainians are still one of the least liked group by the Polish society. So this is how complicated it is. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I second this idea. First of all, our problem with what we're saying when we mean elite. Uh, and, and this asymmetric relationship of elites and knowledge. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that on the one hand, from the Ukrainian side, initially attitudes towards Poland uh, were to a considerable degree influenced by the remnants of the Ukrainian intelligentsia that remained in Western Ukraine and the Ukrainian diaspora in the very first phases. They knew, of, they knew Polish, they knew Polish culture intimately, and in general they didn't like it. And this was their response. The, the, more they knew, the more they knew about Poland, the less that Poland was liked. Of course, the Poland they didn't like was pre-World War II Poland or World War, and they had a considerable influence. Over time, that influence has, of course, died out, quite literally. Uh, and with that, a declining knowledge of Poland. Now, Jaroslav, who was here earlier, also talked about the other Polish influence, the, the young Ukrainian youth who use Poland as a bridge to the West. And that influence has declined. So the two major areas where people intimately knew Polish literature, music, culture, have uh, decreased. And that has, in some ways, improved the situation. On the other hand, uh, if, if from the first of those influences, uh, because then you get people having real contact among each other. Uh, then as far as other diasporas, uh, in the Polish diaspora that I know, sorry for this sort of, but that's the world I knew, you might call it the maslo Soyuz complex. If you asked most Poles uh, after World War II, wh whichever emigration they came from, no, we don't like Ukrainians, yes, they were horrible during World War II, why can they organize so well compared to us, right? They ran maslo Soyuz beautifully, and uh, here they go organize Harvard Institute and a bunch of these things, they're, they're, you know, whereas you know, we Poles you know, argue and fight and whatever. And, I mean, and, the, and like, and Kreditivka. And, and they know how to do Kreditivka. Yes, in so, New York still, in yeah, New yeah, York yeah. they so still go to ask, Ukrainian Kreditivka. Yeah, in, in the, <laughs> the other uh, thing I found very influenced with particularly Polish intelligentsia and romantic traditions was the total misunderstanding of the difference between Ukrainians and Lithuanians. That is, the average uh, Polish intelligent would come from Poland with very pro-Lithuanian attitudes. And then he would meet a Lithuanian in Chicago. <laughs> and, and compared to the very pleasant Galician Ukrainians who talked with him about Mickiewicz and talked in Polish and dealt with all kinds of things, the Lithuanian was like a solid wall as if the, the Pole didn't exist. So you also have these stereotypes that the intelligentsias and elites uh, only after 1989, 91, when you had real contacts with the countries, began to change. 
Uh, and I think that has, that has made a great difference. So I think by now, the, uh, the other um, are, are elite and, uh, uh, and the rest of the population. I think we overestimate the degree particularly uh, that uh, we have any influence. And uh, so to go to our most drastic theme, it was generally thought by the Ukrainian government that it could manage Polish-Ukrainian relations. We heard about the cemetery in, in Lviv, the Orlenta Cemetery, when very carefully the Ukrainian government didn't allow local people to come to the event. Right? They invited the Poles, the Poles came, there, you, were, you were kept out, uh, much of the local population. They did it. You know, they checked their list, reconciliation, we did this and this and this. It's not true. It's not in Bartolina. It was allowed. No, no. It was not allowed, and Boris Kudziak didn't get an invitation except from the Polish side. Yes. Okay. okay. I, I think yes. Yeah. Okay. Very solid yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there, lo the many local people did not did not have a say. But in general, the attitudes of much of the local Lviv population at that time was not taken in because East Kiev had made a decision. Because there are not two, but many Ukrainians, I would say, but 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 very different attitudes. And I would say, in another way, the attitude that somehow the elite decided how the population would deal with UPA and Bandera and these events. As if you could, from some intellectual elite or central headquarters, decide these things, when much of the population had their experience and had their voice. And that voice is, I think, even stronger in Poland, where you have a much more united society and culture, and people don't pay attention to wider segments of Polish population's opinion. a little bit like the tail end Charlie here, the, the rear gunner. Um, I'm a historian who deals with times long ago, and my knowledge of modern Polish or Ukrainian elites is small. Uh, I once got phoned up by the Sun newspaper who said, can you comment on the elections in Poland? And I said, what elections? Which was not a good start. <laughs> I, said, I said, I can tell you about the elections of 1658, but you're probably not interested in that. So no, the Sun was not interested in that. Um, so I'm slightly at a loss to what, uh, as to what to say, but it struck me two things about my contact with Polish elites, and they're to do with an analogy that has grown, has come up today more than once, which is to do with the relations between Poles and Germans. So let me tell the two stories. Um, in 1997, I went on a trip round Poland with the director and his assistant of the Landesmuseum in um, Münster for the great European Union funded uh, exhibition on the 350th anniversary of the Peace of Westphalia. It was to look to get um, exhibits from Eastern Europe. And we ended up in Wrocław, where we had a conversation with the director of the town museum. It was an interesting conversation because he spoke very good German and I was sitting there listening to this. And he talked about the museum, and he talked about Wrocław, and he talked about the Thirty Years' War. And then suddenly he started getting agitated and his German started breaking down and he turned to me and asked to translate into German what he was saying in Polish. And he was saying, the people here in Wrocław, they don't understand what this city is. I thought, uh-huh, we're going interesting places here. He said, they get fed all this Polish nationalist shite. Uh, wait a minute, sorry, is that allowed on the, <laughs> on the feed? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> he said, is, he is said is they do not realize that it. marble from round here built Berlin. And he started reeling off a list of the inhabitant, German inhabitants of Breslau in the past. And I thought, this is really interesting. <laughs> um, and what he was, was a local patriot who was talking about the history of his region and he wasn't concerned about what he called that Polish nationalist shite they get taught in schools. And I found that interesting because I've, been, I've done quite a lot of work in what was Royal Prussia, Polish Prussia. I have very good contacts with the University of Todlin. And I've been very impressed at the way that the Polish-speaking elites after 1945 took on that German heritage, which was there. The institutions were German. The libraries were German. And they looked after it and they promoted it as their history in a local sense. Now, the whole history of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, as I said in my speech, the union worked because it was a decentralized system from the start, and local patriotism played an enormous part. And for a long time, that local patriotism was not about 
conflict and violence. I once gave a talk in the Polish consulate in New York, and I was meant to comment on the 10-minute film on Polish history that's done by computer generation. Some of you may have seen it, which is all about fire and war. It starts with Casimir Ka III off to Kiev, burning Kiev, and then the boys are off somewhere else, and somewhere else burns. And then there's the Second World War, and everything burns. And then the Solidarity, and that's burning too. And I said, wait a minute. What your system, what your part of Europe is about, is about negotiation and peace. The German-Polish border was the most stable border in Europe from the 15th century until certain things happened in, the world, in World War I. The border between Poland and Prussia set at Mielno, the, the Peace of Mielno in 1422, survived until 1919. That's pretty good going, especially in this part of Europe. Um, and that care for that local heritage, that local patriotism, is evident throughout the lands recovered from Germany, shall we call them, in 1945. I was astonished to give my second and final story to go to the reenactment of the Battle of Grunwald, Tannenberg, Jalgiris, whatever you want to call it, in 2010. And we took the children and we drove out. To, we didn't go at the actual one because tickets were, you know, all of Poland was attending it and there were no tickets. So we went to the dress rehearsal, which wasn't a dress rehearsal, it was just a rehearsal. It was very hot. And I was astonished at the reaction of those German parts, formerly German parts of Poland. I have a copy of the Courier Olsztynski, where it talks about our boys, nasi chłopcy, riding out to fight at Grunwald. And they're riding out as Teutonic Knights. They're not riding out as Poles. And it was terrific. And the, it's full of, you know, these Polish swine that are fighting us. And I thought, this is really interesting. <laughs> This is fascinating. Now, <laughs> if you want to get over the similar con problems and difficulties, reinvent that local patriotism. Talk about it's very difficult, given what happened in the 20th century in the eastern borderlands, of where you had all of these divided communities with divided loyalties. It's very difficult after the 20th century to reinvent that local patriotism. But much of the most interesting work I see on places like Lviv, Lvov, Leopolis, Semper Fidelis, Lemberg, whatever you want to call it, is to do with rediscovering that multicultural heritage that includes the Jews, that realizes that Vilnius, that places like Lviv were as much Yiddish speaking as they were Polish speaking. They're Ruthenian speaking. 33% of the Greek Catholics in Lviv, according to the Austrian census of 19 whatever it was, were Polish speaking. Um, religion, language. You know, we live in a system which venerates migration and multicultural systems and how immigrants can get on with each other. Well, for 400 years, the Polish Lithuanian Union did pretty well. And the elites that held it to account were the Lithuanians in the 1560s, when Radzivil Czarny stands up in the Warsaw Sejm of 1564 and says, you Poles are not obeying the principles of your own political system, which is consensus. We have to agree. You are forcing us into what is servitude because we have to agree to what you're doing to us. And he was right. And the Cossacks, Khmelnytsky, in the, in the mid 17th century, say the same. This is a system that talks about citizenship, brotherhood, fraternitas, and I can't get proper justice from a local court system which is run by Catholics who won't give orthodox nobles like me justice. Your system is failing, and it's you that are doing it. And the Cossack revolt was as much about that as anything. The Rzeczpospolita down there was failing to live up to its own principles. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Robert. William Blanca. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make two points. Maybe one, one referring to, to something that Pavel said and also following on from, from what Robert said as well. Um, in terms of the kind of the um, attitudes towards Ukraine and, and, and this kind of uh, this uh, problem of polarization in, in uh, Polish kind of public sphere and published debates, uh, in, in public debates, I think it's kind of I find it kind of interesting and sort of puzzling sometimes to observe how how that plays out. Um, there are kind of 
sort of two paradoxes that I often find myself observing um, in looking at the kind of the more, let's say, conservative um, camp of Polish society and their attitudes towards Ukraine, which at its kind of extreme end um, starts to come round to, you know, if you, if you look at the, the website Kresy.pl, which I do on occasion, there's this kind of weird sort of um, um, taking on of the sort of Russian propaganda mm -hmm. against, against Ukraine and, and Bandera and so on and so on, and there's a sort of strange alliance there. Um, on the other hand, and I think ev even I think more interesting in some ways is the way the kind of more progressive liberal camp uh, relates to Ukraine, um, and it's in this kind of uh, perceived need to um, take on board the Ukrainian point of view, to understand, to hear the Ukrainian voice, to not let our kind of Polish uh, sort of national prejudices get in the way, which often kind of goes, in some ways, it's, a, it's that sort of gesture, it seems to me that kind of gesture of we are listening to the Ukrainian point of view, sometimes kind of seems to be more important than what the actual content of that point of view is. Mm -hmm. um, so you get this, you know, and, and this has been, this has come up in Polish public debates where you get so the, ac the accusations against the Gazeta Wyborcza and, and people like Michnik of being kind of um, in alliance with Ukrainian nationalists, um, with kind of uh, being over tolerant of, of the sort of cult of Bandera and so on in the UPA. Um, and, you know, I think the, there is this curious paradox when they're looking at, uh, among that kind of section of the Polish public opinion, looking at those um, problems in Ukraine, um, there's this level of tolerance, whereas um, similar attitudes in their own country would be, you know, it would be sort of something that which they would definitely distance themselves from. I mean, w one, where I kind of saw this, or uh, where I sort of started to think about it was actually looking at, because um, I, I deal with literature, not history, was looking at the reception of Oksana Zabuszko's last novel in, mm. in Poland, mm. which in the kind of liberal press and Gazeta mm. Wyborcza, um, you know, the, you can read numerous articles uh, receiving this novel extremely warmly. Um, and you know, and, and a novel which, um, which, which was criticized by you know, historians like Grzegorz Matyka, for example, or his presentation of the UPA. Um, and I think in, in some ways, you know, I was sort of puzzled by the willingness to embrace a novel among the kind of more liberal progressive part of uh, Polish public opinion. Whereas, you know, I was thinking a, a similar an analogous novel about the Armia Krajowa or the Żołnierze Wyklęci would not be received in the same way by those same intellectual mm -hmm. circles, I think. Um, so I think there's, there's a certain kind of paradox there which I think is interesting and I, and I sort of wonder what, what people think about that. Um, and the second thing was, was this idea of um, sort of local patriotism or, or this kind of uh, rediscovery of multicultural pasts. Um, I mean, one thing I look at in my own research is how, how this is actually done in both Poland and Ukraine um, by contemporary writers and you get actually very, very similar approaches to, you know, you can analyze uh, writers writing about Wrocław in, in Poland and writers writing about Lviv uh, in Ukraine. And sometimes, you know, it, the, some of the things they are saying are really interchangeable, actually. It's, it's very interesting. Um, but there, I think there are, there are certain differences and certain kind of uh, mm. asymmetries within that. And I think this word asymmetry came up today, mm. uh, which I think Quite is an often. important one. Um, I mean, in terms of the, 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 that process in Poland, you know, you can you could name a whole list of books which uh, of you know contemporary novels um, which are about um, you know these post-German territories, about Wrocław, uh, about Gdańsk. Um, same sort of dealing with the the Jewish past, Poland's Jewish past. You know, this, this is a huge kind of uh, source of inspiration for contemporary uh, Polish writers. The Ukrainian part, much less so, I think. It's kind of, in some ways, it's a sort of missing part of the jigsaw. There are, there are you could contemporary Polish writers who do write about this, um, but at a much, much lower level. They're much, much kind of smaller numbers. Um, and in terms of how Ukrainian writers are rediscovering these pasts, um, you know, I, th I think there's a certain amount of um, overlap between these writers, actually. And some of them, you know, there is, for example, this publication by Yuri Andrukhovich and Andrzej Stashuk, which they, they publish a book together, which is kind of on this topic. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of overlap between these writers. Mm -hmm. um, 
But again, there's that, that sort of Polish-Ukrainian uh, axis is a little bit problematic in the Ukraine, among the Ukrainian writers as well. Mm. I don't think it's, this is a theme that has not really been fully worked through. Mm. Um, it's not, it's a, it's, there are other aspects of the multicultural past that they're more willing to talk about. And I think that kind of works on, on both sides among the kind of uh, contemporary writers. Anyway. Can I just add a little on base of that a little ride on what I said about the German borderlands? There is a difference, as William has pointed out. Poles have always traditionally had a veneration for German culture that was of the West and took on board a lot of it, a lot more than they suspect sometimes, I think. Um, that's the West. That's the, of course, the Poles are in a different position in their own minds, I think, as much as anything else with regard to the East. It's that Polish civilizing, mm -hmm. you should be listening to our model, not mm -hmm. rejecting it as you did in 1648. So there is a difference. Mm -hmm. And I would stress that I see that difference. Before we open up uh, questions to the audience, we do want to include our, our audience beyond Cambridge and, and uh, include questions from, of course, my co-moderator, Stanley Bill. Stanley? Um, well, we have a tweet uh, here that's for Carolina Vigura, actually, in response to her provocative suggestion that fear of Russia, in fact, could be the basis of authentic relations between Poland and Ukraine. And the tweet says, it can be the start, it can't be the end. Uh, now, first of all, for Carolina, I would point out that Carolina did make it clear that authenticity, but not necessarily longevity. Uh, I'll allow uh, Carolina, of course, to respond to the tweet herself, but then I thought that this provocative question we could perhaps throw open to some other uh, members of the panel. This question of whether uh, this, the fear of Russia is a significant basis for strong uh, Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations, or a sufficient basis. Carolina. Um, I think it's a great tweet. Thank you very much. Um, the tweet, by the way, the tweet, by the way, was from Avi Wolf. Just so we have the, the name. Thank you, Avi Wolf. Um, uh, I, but I agree. I mean, I and I did and I did um, say a very similar thing in my presentation, saying that it is a guarantee for authenticity, but not necessarily for longevity. And we know it from a very similar situation that we have had in Europe. If it is true that the European project uh, is based on fear of the past, uh, then we know already after decades of integrating Europe that, the, that fear is diminishing. It is diminishing for many, many reasons. So for example, it, it is diminishing because of the change of the generations. This is normal demographic factor. It is also diminishing because of globalization. So for example, the Holocaust that used to be the center of the European culture of memory um, has now uh, many, uh, well, th there are also very many other genocides and cultures different than European tell Europe, well, we don't want to think that the Holocaust is the center of our culture of me memory too. We have our own things we would like to commemorate and think about. So, so this is another reason. There are many more reasons. So basically, we have now um, an ambivalent situation in Europe where a very strong passion, and fear is one of the strongest passion, ha is diminishing, and it is leaving a, a hollow space. Now, this hollow space is being colonized by people who think that fear is a good tool, a political tool, but not necessarily they have uh, democratic and liberal intentions. I mean, for example, populistic parties that are now gaining more and more popularity in France, in Holland, in, in, in Finland, perhaps in Poland, we don't know that yet, that, that perceive immigrants as a threat. And they, they colonize the, the, the hollow space that was left by, by the fear of the past, they're, they're putting it there, the fear of a stranger instead. So we have a great problem with European identity and European integration and to, uh, to, 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 to say so with the, with the prevailing passion in Europe. And I think the same situation we can have in, in Polish-Ukrainian relations. If we let ourselves to base only on fear, then within a few decades we'll have the same problem. The fear will, will uh, somehow diminish. This is a fear of Russia. It is not a fear of ourselves. 
Yes, in Europe it was more or less a fear of ourselves, what we can do, what atrocities we can do, as Germans, as Poles, and etc., etc. Whereas here it is, it would be enough to change the regime in Russia, and the fear would just disappear. So, and then what? What is then the basis? So I believe, I believe, yes, it is a start, but not the end. But everything is in our hands, I think. Um, just, just last, um, last uh, uh, remark. Uh, I do believe that reconciliation in politics is not only about values, passions, and interests, but also about economics. Um, five years ago, uh, general attitude of German population towards the Poles would be completely different than, before, th than, than now. It is now completely different because of the Polish economic success, and I have no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the stereotypic uh, Polnische Wirtschaft, so, so a stereotype of badly organized or economy and bad organization as such, has, has changed its meaning. Now Polnische Wirtschaft is something very positive in Germany. So, so, so I do believe, um, this is difficult to, it, it, it's, 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 it's difficult to say that, but I do believe the only guarantee of a long lasting reconciliation between Poland and Ukraine is the Ukrainian economic success, and I wish Ukraine this success very, very much. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, make uh, two points, but uh, before we didn't define what we actually we mean by reconciliation. This is a very, very blurred word. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> not really, because there were like few, few, few definitions uh, floating. Um, we accept the Carolina's definition. <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, so I'll go to my point. Um, as Slavko said, that before the Polish-Ukrainian um, reconciliation, we would need to have uh, Ukrainian, um, Ukrainian reconciliation. And here is a very, very big difference between Poland. Here I'm referring to also what Robert Frost said. Um, the very, very big difference that we used to, sometimes we forget, is that differently than Ukraine, Poland is the most homogeneous country in Europe. Uh, and actually it's a, it's a it's pretty interesting and unusual phenomenon. Um, we don't have immigrants. We have some Vietnamese. And maybe we're, I don't think that even Ukrainians are coming. They, 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 they're passing through, I think, but maybe they're coming now. But according to the statistics and the way how we perceive each other, how we are socialized as well, we are socialized as a part of the very, very homogeneous country, which actually makes us pretty disabled when it comes to otherness. It can be pretty problematic uh, when we talk about um, reconciliation. Um, and the, the second point would be that um, most of us are historians or somehow we deal with the history. So we have this kind of band, I think. I mean, if Pope will lose his faith, he will lose a good job as well. Um, so, so this is what actually what, what happens to us, I think, or to, to historians. Um, and I'll tell you something which I know from autopsy, because my organization, as it was mentioned, works also in Ukraine, not because we are our mission is dedicated to Ukraine, not at all. It's just that we, um, that we found out that there are Ukrainians that want to do the same thing. We, we are also in Russia, and good, because we, especially now that during this conflict, we work as Polish-Ukrainian-Russian organization. Um, and actually, and this, it, hap it, it happens, to the, I mean, it happened 2008 that the people wanted also to create their cultural center, journal, they wanted also to publish books, do exhibitions involving culture, do similar things that we did at, this, at that point. But um, we don't talk about uh, history. We don't talk about collective remembrance. We don't talk about memory. We don't work even according to this. There are not, we don't, I don't even feel that there are some sentiments behind, behind it. I think that what is important, and again, this is something, this is the first assumption of reconciliation, that there are two sides, that there is division, actually. But this, I think, is a philosophy of the previous generation. The, the, I, I hope, now I'm projecting, I'm, I hope uh, it's a 
partly a diagnosis, but partly a wish that my generation is a generation of, of, of one step ahead, that it's not going to be dialogue anymore, it's not going to be reconciliation anymore, it's going to be like one side. And, uh, we, um, and we share so many similar assumptions, we share so many similar aims um, that we don't really need any dialogue. I, I'm, I'm not dialoguing with my f friends uh, uh, in, in Ukraine. We are one camp. Um, um, it is different with Russia, H how, uh, but because, rather because we have very, very different cultural history and the social capital inside Ukraine, I'm talking about part, of course, Ukraine, not Lvov. I mean, this Ukraine, which was, uh, let's say, the, this left bank of, of Dniepr. Social capital there, and social capital in, in, in Poland, the way how we work, organize each other, the way how we behave socially uh, and, and collectively uh, is so, so similar and different in Russia, then it makes a problem when it comes to Russia, but not at all when it comes to Ukraine. So maybe there's not gonna be any need for reconciliation on this level uh, between. Maybe we, are, we can do this step uh, on, we can move on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very briefly, uh, I would like to address this question about fear. Uh, fear is um, a, a concept um, and a feeling uh, that even cultural historians uh, find difficult to um, historicize and conceptualize. I would like rather to talk about how uh, Poland and Ukraine and Polish Ukrainian elites uh, today uh, view Russia and uh, what is going on in Ukraine vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. Um, I believe uh, there is a deeply inserted fear, I'm using it right now, um, about the historical fate of Ukraine. Um, many Poles are very well aware of four partitions of Poland, 1772, 1793, 1795, three partitions when Prussia, Austria, and, and Russia partitioned Poland, and of course, the partition of the so-called fourth partition of Poland um, in September 1939. Um, what happened um, after August 1991 um, as the result of the collapse of the Soviet Union is that the border, um, the imaginary border between what we call East and what we call West moved radically eastward. And now this border that separates the imaginary Europe from the imaginary Asia um, is the eastern border of Ukraine, which implies, which people should have thought about it a couple of years ago, which implies that now Ukraine might undergo, uh, m might have the same fate, the same political fate that Poland had uh, in the 18th century or, God forbid, in the mid 20th century. That is to say, Ukraine um, becomes an object of partition, and it is very much partitioned uh, ideologically, politically, economically between Russia and uh, the rest of Europe. And that Russia is trying to bite pieces of Ukraine, uh, Donetsk uh, and Luhansk uh, district, and of course the annexation of Crimea, is the beginning, and I hope the end, of that attempt of Russia to partition Ukraine as Russia had partitioned Poland in the 18th century. That creates a um, shared sense of fear vis-a-vis -vis Russia among the Polish and among the Ukrainian elites. I would like, I'm throwing this um, as, as an idea, I would like to hear what people think about that, but I, but I, I, I discussed uh, this particular situation in Ukraine in the context of Polish partitions of the 18th century and, uh, and I got some positive and some, some positive responses and also some questions. Uh, I would like to hear what people think about that. Yes, let's open the floor to questions, by the way. If anyone else would like to jump in, of course, and address a question of fear, please do so. But let me uh, take some questions. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, my name is Václav Slezak. I'm just a layman, so thank you for all your inputs, especially from Karolina. So my question is actually inspired by yesterday's films. I would like to ask you, if we eliminate politicians from the equation of reconciliation, can we make fast and better progress? Because yesterday in the films we saw how normal people could live together, support each other, defended each other against terrible 
atrocities by politicians. I think politicians are a barrier to progress in reconciliation between nations. So can we make more progress by letting people decide more for themselves about reconciliation rather than leaving it to the politicians, to the so-called elites? I just want to mention that the films referred to here uh, are uh, three stories of Galicia uh, directed by Ole Onishko and Sara Farhat and My Friend the Enemy uh, directed by Wanda Kosha, who is here with us in the audience today. Thank you very much for that question. Would anyone like to take uh, a stab at it? Do politicians matter? I think the one thing positive about politicians is that those were Polish politicians after 1989. That is, it was after all a Polish political elite at, at that point. No, but at that, no, but talking on Ukrainian, uh, well, excuse, uh, but talking about Ukrainian-Polish relations, that is the, the political elite of Poland at a crucial moment uh, for whatever reasons, and you know, we can discuss what these reasons were, followed a policy and followed it at least for a number of years that had positive results. So I'm not saying that politicians do not do uh, disrail things frequently, but there are times when politics matters. And the other, I would argue, is one of the great mistakes uh, made in Ukraine uh, throughout a, a number of attempts at reform was for people to become disengaged from politics. That is, uh, uh, we are disappointed with the Orange Revolution, and therefore we don't care what will happen, and therefore in 2010, we don't care what happens with the presidential election. Well, we've all seen the results of that, what it's brought Ukraine. I mean, it, w it was a tragic mistake. Or the assumption that we will only care about the economy, uh, not realizing that without political change, it was impossible to bring out uh, bring out uh, economic change in Ukraine. So we've seen some disastrous disengagements from politics, so that could bring a danger as well. Um, if I may, yes. the, the, the words. If we speak about, uh, <coughs> if we speak, if we speak about, uh, about mistakes of Polish politicians, I think that the problem is in another place. I, I saw two, 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 two problems. First, that we lost last many years for for uh, uh, an institu institutionalization institutionalization of uh, historical dialogue, we should look, for example, uh, for a good example uh, of uh, Polish-Russian dialogue. We worked uh, more effectively on that field. I mean, uh, institution. I mean strategic plan. We didn't lose time for action because Polish politicians effectively supported of uh, revolution, of uh, national movement of Ukraine in the uh, Orange Revolution. The same situ situation wa was uh, during the Euromaidan. And we have problem with strategic plan. And the second, the second is really important today. Today, in our uh, internal discussion about Ukraine, about Polish Eastern policy, in uh, Polish uh, uh, internal circumstances, that we uh, say too much about aid, about support. Maybe it was an element of uh, historical paternalism. We should to propose and to spoke to opinion school. <coughs> about the common program, about the common plan for, fu for the future. Uh, this is a problem. Because we, mm, uh, we, if you, if you, for example, if you, if you, if you look for, for Polish television one year ago, if you uh, look for the political discussion, Practically every, uh, every politician will uh, sa said that we will support Ukraine. We will, set, we will send to Ukraine anything, goods, uh, uh, weapon, and another, another, another. And in consequence, we have a real gap. Declaration, official declaration, and not so active work on that field. And the people have the head. 
that we supported Ukraine and Ukrainians didn't answer picture. I had, I had, meeting, I had meeting in uh, Zeshov. One young doctor said, uh, you know, Mr. Koval, I delivered many years and goods, uh, books, I don't know what, 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 to one school in, let's we say, Stanislav. And asked, and? And uh, one body of Ukrainian origin painted on the one wall in Przemysl Trizup. And ask and <laughs> and what to do? Asked that young young doctor. It's a typical. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a typical misunderstanding. The people think in category to help, to send anything, to aid. And we have problem with imagine that Ukraine will maybe in future our main partner if Ukraine will have success. Because we think about Ukraine and about future of our neighbor only in, the in category of tra tragedy. tragedy. This, is tra tra this is a problem. And uh, the problem is not a reaction of Polish politicians. Because the reaction was really wonderful from all political parties. Kwaśniewski, Kaczyński, Komorowski. It's not a problem. Problem is a plan, and problem is our meaning, our understanding of roles in the mm, common plan for the future. Thank you. Yes, Karolina. Um, the question was, if we eliminate politicians, can we have better and faster reconciliation process? Um, I would, I would start from the beginning and say if we didn't have politicians, we wouldn't have the need to reconcile. Um, this was very well visible in the film Three Stories of Galicia yesterday. And it was also extremely well visible in Pavo Koma, a small village uh, that uh, has become uh, a, a symbol of Polish-Ukrainian uh, um, uh, reconciliation. Um, in, 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 uh, in the 2000s. Pavlokoma was a peaceful village where uh, Ukrainians and Poles uh, lived together and they have lived for decades like this. And, and it was the politicians or the great politics that, has, that have brought uh, uh, division, hatred and, and mass killings. And Pavlokoma, uh, in Pavlokoma uh, over, over 300 people including, I, um, there, there, is a, there is a quarrel about it, whether it was including women and, and children, but let's say per, probably yes. Um, they, they were burned in a, in a, in a church uh, as, a, as, a, as a revenge after Bowen. And Pawukoma is just one example of many, many villages in, in, in eastern, today's eastern Poland, uh, where, where this happened. So, so we can say that, that the, the, the atrocities were caused by the politicians, and, and this perhaps brings the responsibility of the politicians to, to, to start the process of reconciliation. But, but this, the, there is something very deep, deep in this question, I believe, because, because of this fatigue that we have with reconciliation and declarations of forgiveness and repentance as such. They have been um, articulated so many times that I don't really think they can influence the social consciousness anymore. Um, in, in, for example, in those very famous examples, like the letter of the Polish bishops to the German bishops from 1965, or kneeling of Willy Brandt in Warsaw in 1970, the important thing was the outrage of the societies. So exactly because the Poles were so negatively uh, reacting to the letter of the bishops, uh, of the Polish bishops. Exactly that's why we had this, this, the, the, the beginning of a very deep discussion. A very similar thing in, in, in the Willy Brandt's case. Exactly because the society has reacted negatively at the very beginning, there was a chance for a wider discussion. There is no 
uh, though no possibility today to repeat any letter and to expect such a reaction, or to kneel anywhere and to ex expect such a reaction. This is perhaps the reason for which no other politician has done what Willy Brandt has done. This would be only political kitsch, and we, we need something more. Little uh, Watson, uh, to your question. You, all of you know this exchange between Tim Snyder and Tony Judd. And Judd actually makes uh, uh, the opposite point and, and, and has a very, very interesting and very good argument, um, which is based on the very um, um, illustrative example. Actually, um, when you follow the history of anti Semitism, the real tragedy begins when the empires collapses. And then when the masses, when the, when the regular people are entering the scene, then there is a real problem and the real atrocities uh, begun. When you have an uh, empire, when you have a state, when you have a po politicians, then, then, you can, then this, those groups could negotiate and could defend themselves because there was one actor, or like few at least. When masses are entering the scene, it's, it's they are they, they cannot they couldn't defend themselves. So, at, at least when it comes to Jews, the politicians actually played the, the opposite role. Like that the, they saved them as long as they could, uh, of course. But actually, I think I think the truth is on both sides. Like you, you, you can blame them sometimes. You, you can you can praise them, uh, in other times. Yes, actually, Slavomir said what I, what I intended to say, because really, uh, uh, I, I, I would like to play the role of Advocato Diabolo and to defend politicians, even though I <laughs> dislike them, uh, usually. Uh, I feel that it's wrong uh, dichotomy, wrong opposition between you know, good, good people and bad politicians. Both of them, both sides could be very bad and very good. Uh, so uh, I, I don't see any, any regularity here, any you know, iron law. Of course, p uh, politicians can manipulate and can misuse uh, popular feelings and so on, but also they can mitigate them and can civilize and gentrify uh, public mood. So it depends. Uh, and uh, common folk also is not so good. You know, people are uh, ugly. You, not all, also, not all the time, but very often. Um, so uh, it, it depends. Uh, we have. We have to remember that uh, xenophobia is a biological instinct. It's, uh, uh, you know, uh, any, any uh, creature has it. You know, not only human beings, but also animals. Xenophobia is not about hatred, it's about fear, first of all. It's fear of alien, literally. And uh, it's biological, yes, because everything that is unknown for us evokes some, uh, some suspicion. It's dangerous, it could be dangerous. So uh, the only way to overcome this basic instinct is to gentrify, to, 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 uh, to educate, to civilize. Um, and uh, we can do this ours ourselves through socializing, through, through knowledge. Uh, but also politicians can play a positive role if they you know, introduce some you know, culture and education, uh, etc. Because people themselves are not necessarily uh, great. We know uh, we have a lot of evidences, for example, that um, people in the village they can protect uh, a couple of Jews from this village because they are our Jews, and especially if they are good artisans, they of course they can protect them and hide and so on and help. But at the same time, the same people will go to the other village, village to for pogrom because they are uh, other Jews. They are abstract Jews. You know, uh, there are a lot of such facts. Uh, the same people they, they, they operate in different way. Mm, just because of, in this case, they have some social experience and, uh, and, and, they, have, and they don't have it in the other case. Okay, and Wait, uh, go ahead, I'm going to two, two sentences. Uh, okay, and in fact, politicians uh, have to uh, have a program and plan. And today, it's a, a special moment in Polish-Ukrainian relations. We have a special opportunity. And concerning the historical policy, I think that you, we should establish a special institution and to uh, provide historical dialogue on the special principles, like uh, Center for Pol Polish-Russian Dialogue. Uh, we should uh, have money for that institution. We should have a plan for 
exchanging of young people. We lost time after the Orange Revolution, and we have the second historical opportunity. And we as a politicians should use that opportunity. And the second question, in communication with the people, with the voters, we should use the category of benefits. We should uh, discuss about Polish-Ukrainian relations more in a category like in international rela relations. It could be really fruitful to say to the people, let's do today invest money, let's do today invest uh, the, the, the people, the time of the people, and we'll have benefits in the future. We should start discuss uh, with voters in Poland, with uh, citizens in Dutch category. Thanks. Um, yeah, just to follow on with the discussion of politicians and to come back to this uh, example of Pavel Koma as well, which I think is an, an important one. Um, the, I mean, I think that the, the 2008 commemorations, the so 65th anniversary of voting, were very interesting in the way that so Pavel Koma became this this kind of symbol of the reconciliation and. But in many ways, because the politicians decided to go there and kind of make it that make it that way, so you had Yushchenko and um, Kaczynski go there. So these the two politicians who are kind of very active in terms of memory politics, actually, um, and in many ways very quite nationalistic memory politics. Um, yet, going there and making some, some quite significant progress, arguably in terms of reconciliation. And if, then, if you fast forward uh, five years. 2013, you get a very different atmosphere around the anniversary, um, and it's interesting to look at who the who the presidents were at that time. You had Yanukovych and Komorovsky, so two presidents who kind of, in different ways, I guess, take a, a more distanced approach to um, memory politics. You know, who, who are not so concerned about them. I mean, yeah, I mean, you could argue with that, mm. um, but the kind of the public discourse, the media discourse, was much more, I think, antagonistic. Around the, uh, you know, there was much less of a reconcil reconciliatory atmosphere around the 70th anniversary of Moline. Um I don't know is wh why that might be is a kind of interesting question. I'm sure it's a complicated question. Maybe in part, I think part because people, certain segments of the population in both countries felt that their um, their memories, their visions of the past were not being represented in some way. Certainly in Ukraine, you know, the, the Yanukovych effect kind of very much increased the sense of protectiveness of Ukrainian, the Ukrainian view of their own past. Um, and when you had Yan, Yan, uh, Yushchenko in place, you, you, there's a sense that, okay, we're being represented now. So kind of removing the political representation of a certain vision of the past can also I guess op open the way for um, maybe more um, polarization in some ways. Yeah. Robert? Yeah, you have to distinguish between politicians. I mean, politicians are not a group, there are politicians and politicians. Putin is a politician. Tadeusz Mazowiecki was a politician. They are completely different beasts. And um, we some, in democratic societies, we know that we sometimes get the politicians we deserve because we ask impossible things of them. We ask them to provide us with the best possible public services without paying any taxes or paying as few taxes as possible. The Schlachter knew all about that one. Um, so we have to be careful. Um, politicians in Poland and Ukraine are performing a very difficult task. They have to get elected. They have to play to things that will get them elected. And like politicians everywhere, when they're elected, they've got to think about which of the promises I made that I didn't want to make that I now don't want to um, implement. We can see Mr. Cameron doing this at the moment. Um, so we can't just, like, um, politicians can help and harm. Where politicians are Democrat, demagogues or populists and whip up fear. That is something to look at. And on the, um, on the communities of neighbors living together for years and years, yes, that mechanism is very powerful. I, I think it's Goebbels, but if it's Himmler, somebody tell me, you know, actually said, yes, of course, we all know a Jew that we want to protect and help because we know him, but we have to be hard 
The ones we don't know are from another village. That's something else, because that becomes the other that we demonize and politicians can make play with. Um, just a quick comment on Russia and the fear thereof. I don't know if people saw there was an interesting um, opinion poll. I mean, how many people took part in it, I don't know. But the Museum of Polish History conducted on the occasion of the 500th anniversary of the Battle of Orsha, asking, should Poland have been helping our Lithuanian brothers to um, meet the power of Russia? Or should we have been concentrating on the Teutonic Knights and the Western borders and getting them back? And it came out 52% saying, yes, we should have been helping our Lithuanian brothers, and 48% saying, no, we should have been recovering the Western lands. I found that balance of opinion quite interesting. Um, I don't know what it says. I just throw it into the air to, to discuss. But I mentioned, I started off by mentioning Putin as a politician who quite clearly is instrumentalizing. We've said today that Russia is so important and massive in this question of Polish-Ukrainian relations. At the moment, that's so obvious, I don't need to say it. But we mustn't go into demonizing all Russians, even though he seems terribly popular. We know there are politicians in Russia who oppose him. And some of us from my generation are older enough to remember what opposing politicians in power in that sort of system can mean for those who oppose him. And we've seen plenty of, offer, of um, examples of that. And we know that there are historians in, Russian, in Russia who do not quite take the line that is generally taken. And dialogue with them, I was attending a conference in April in Warsaw organized by Wukasz's Centrum for Polish-Russian Dialogue. My taxi driver taking, it to, taking me to it said, well, that's going to be a short conference. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> but that is precisely the sort of thing that we need to be doing and reaching out to Russians as well in this dialogue. Yeah, I have to second that. And, uh, and I'm amazed how successful Putin has been in some ways. We remember his saying that uh, the Swedes Lithuanians and Poles wanted to refight the Battle of Poltava, right? Uh, that he was able to sell this as a line and turn against Swedish, and the Swedes are not at the moment, however militaristic they may have been in the, in the 17th century, it's been a long time. Not since Poltava. Yeah, since uh, Sweden was, was involved in interventions uh, of this sort. Uh, and uh, I think when, when this issue of fear came up, uh, yes, yeah, so the, uh, the, the way to bring Polish, Ukrainian, I would add Lithuanian, and whatever groups involved in, what has been very, very disheartening is to see how successful the Russian side has been posing this as a certain, if not uh, Polish, Ukrainian, Lithuanian, whatever, paranoia. The Swedes, I don't think, get called paranoia generally in this thing yet. Uh, uh, but the inability to reach out, and the only way I see around that is uh, by reaching out to those groups. So the Russians and the Poles and Ukrainians can do this together. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would go a long way to reaching out. And as I think was brought up earlier, uh, Ukraine being this bridge with half, half Russian-speaking population, or whatever percentage we will see in the future of, uh, of where it is, uh, it's, it's crucial for Ukraine that, that, that somehow on that level of, of cultural and other affairs there be a reach out to Russia. And, and it would be very good if Poland were not seen as opposing that, uh, but uh, what working with it. Right, we have time for uh, two more questions. The uh, last one I'm going to take, if you don't mind. But Alessia, I think you have a question. Um, I'd like to go back to the uh, point uh, that Serhii Plahi made earlier today, that this current war in Ukraine, uh, tragic as it is, could potentially be seen as a, um, a chance, an opportunity, and uh, among other things, an opportunity for reconciliation, discussions, dialogues with uh, Poland as well. Um, and we've discussed, or you, you've mentioned quite a few potential missed opportunities um, of the Polish politicians, and I'd like to perhaps maybe encourage the discussion of the missed opportunities by the Ukrainian politicians, and I'll stick to the we'll to the to the hype the, the dichotomy. This is 
the, the dichotomy of the sort of society and high politics. Uh, if I if I if I can agree uh, um, with the idea of two Ukraines, it'll only be in the sense that there's a state and high politics and the society, and these are very different Ukraines indeed. Um, so okay, you've already mentioned Yushchenko's memory politics, and there was a spectacular U-turn that was extremely harmful. Um, towards the end of his uh, uh, term. Uh, Yanukovych was simply not interested. He was interested in a different kind of memory politics. Um, so the question really is, the most recent decommunization laws, especially one law in particular, um, passed by the new regime, um, is that the first nail in the, in, or maybe if not the last nail in the coffin of re reconciliation with Poland, or the new opportunity for reconciliation? Would anyone like to take uh, a question? Yes. Yes, Lukas, yeah. well, Only short comment, because I think uh, Slavomir's statement requires a short comment. I think we belong to the same generation, and I strongly disagree with the statement that our generation do not need dialogue. I think dialogue, especially historical dialogue, dialogue about history, is needed from different reasons. But one of one, the most important reason is political. Namely, dialogue provoke tensions among public opinions. Uh, of different countries of uh, our region. As such, uh, it affects also policy, politics. And therefore, I would say, no, demand that uh, dialogue is, is not needed, uh, I think uh, is quite no, bizarre for, for me. Reconciliation, reconciliation, I agree. This term might be uh, interpreted in a different way, and it requires, as you said, and I agree, that there are two parties, our party and their parties. And I, I'm speaking on my own behalf, not on, on the behalf of, uh, let's say, imaginar, imaginary Polish party. But dialogue is something uh, different, and I strongly concur Pavel's, uh, Pavel's uh, opinion that also Polish-Ukrainian dialogue needs institutions institutionalization. Thank you. No worries. Yeah. No worries. I said that we should move on. I didn't say that we don't need dialogue. Dialogue is the one thing which is in process. No one wants to stop it, even me. I just wanted to do something to add to it, okay? Because dialogue will still uh, preserve two sides. I think there is some field of maneuver not only, we d there are not only possibility of making steps back, but I just wanted to express that there is some place ahead of us. That's, that's, that's what I think is important to mm -hmm. emphasize. Nikola, would you like to try to take uh, a stab at answering Olaz's question about uh, Ukrainian politicians and these oh, recent history laws? Yes, yeah. it could no, be interesting. It's, it's a very long story. Uh, first of all, I don't think that all, this, uh, all those laws uh, uh, were very harmful. Actually, they were very artificially fanned and, and uh, exaggerated. Both the Yushchenko's Ukaz, which was meaningless, absolutely, and didn't affect Ukrainian life in any visible way. And without these repercussions, without all this uh, fuzz, internationally, it, it would probably be forgotten next day after this uh, Ukaz was issued, or decree. Uh, and the same with these laws, actually. Well, laws, uh, laws are a bit different, laws about decommunization. I feel that they are necessary, but of course, as most Ukrainian laws, they are very poorly formulated. That's, that's a big problem, of course. Uh, but there were some uh, important amendments already, and uh, all the laws in Ukraine are, no, important laws are passing uh, expert, uh, expertise in various commissions. So uh, we expect also further amendments from various commissions, and which were probably also would be uh, uh, passed, approved by the parliament. So it's not so bad, actually, as it looks. And the most importantly, I think that uh, unfortunately in Ukraine, uh, many laws are uh, written uh, with sort of predictions that they would not be fully fulfilled. And because of this, uh, everything possible things are uh, put in this bag with a hope that at least something would be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a big Ukraine problem, that laws are not uh, implemented. And because of this, uh, uh, law, uh, lawmakers, uh, they uh, produce too many laws and too many paragraphs which are a priori uh, obsolete. 
this is the problem. It's not, uh, this is not a country with rule of law, I, I feel. But again, I don't think that these laws are so bad, and uh, I'm sure that they are necessary. This is another matter how they should be formulated and, uh, and implemented. That's okay. another issue. Thank you. I think we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, I just want to ask uh, our participants um, to engage in a speed round with me uh, very quickly. Um, we've talked quite a bit about um, asymmetry between um, uh, or in um, Polish-Ukrainian relations. Uh, and I was hoping that uh, if you're able, um, in a sentence or two, um, to suggest what might be the first step towards a symmetric relationship uh, between Poland and Ukraine. What would that symmetrical relation uh, look like and what is the first gesture, first move uh, to get there? This is, of course, putting aside the obvious answer of the cessation of, of war in Ukraine at the moment. Um, uh, and also putting aside the question of whether actually relations with states are actually ever really symmetrical. Um, but I'm wondering about your suggestions, again, in a sentence or two. Uh, starting with Robert Frost, if you have any ideas. You give us a three-sentence question, one-to-one -one <laughs> sentence answer. I'll give you a one-word answer, respect. Mm -hmm. Frank? What Ukraine will be formed from this war, and that Poland look realistically at what Ukraine is uh, within a year or two, and to find a relationship with that Ukraine, because it's going to be very different from the Ukraine we recently had. It's diff very difficult. Um, you can pass if you wish. No, no, well, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll say or the one thing that comes to, comes to mind is um, I'll be talking tomorrow about cultural literary con context, so maybe I'll say a little bit about that, cultural politics, cultural policy maybe. Um, I mean, one thing that you, that, you, that you find in the dynamics of cultural exchange between uh, Ukraine and Poland is that it, it kind of tends to go uh, one way more, I think. That, you know, you, you, let, let's say writers. Ukrainian writers are more influenced by Polish writers than the other way around. Um, and I think that there's, there's a good way that that could be solved, um, which is if the Ukrainian state, if it ever has the resources, um, should invest more in um, advertising itself, promoting its, its culture abroad, especially in, in Poland. And just for the record, that was two sentences. William was using a number of commas and semicolons, no full stops. <laughs> Carolina? This is really great. I had this remark in my notes, and I didn't know what to do with it. And you just asked the question, and I can say it. Um, um, I think it's, it's, it would be wrong to, to use two big words. So I, I, should, I, I think we should resign from brotherhood, solidarity, and forgiveness. Brotherhood especially, because it has two sides. Brotherhood is very nice, but also there is elder and younger brother. And it somehow is so that y Ukraine is always the younger one. And this doesn't help the relations. So two why don't we? Two separate brothers. Yes. So, so why, don't we, why don't we just speak about normality? And we start with this. Um, I would suggest grassroots, NGO-based forms of uh, cooperation and getting to know one another. Um, to me, e equality means the equal right to make mistakes. <laughs> um, I said a few words about uh, I think that uh, first, as I say, uh, on the historical field, to pay more attention for real historical problems. Uh, it's extremely important for the future to establish maybe one, only one, new institution dedicated especially for the historical, uh, for, 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 for the hi historical questions. Uh, and in consequence, to have more time for thinking about future. And about future, think only in category of common benefits. Mm -hmm. Do not speak about aid, do not speak about support, speak about benefits, to have a common plan in a field of economy, for example, uh, self-government and other. Uh, 
my tomorrow's topic, so I would abstain. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Your abstention, your abstention is, is, is permitted, of course. I'd like to thank the participants for letting me put them on the spot like that, and uh, to thank them for a very thoughtful and stimulating discussion. I'd like to thank all of you and all our viewers online for your tweets and, and comments and questions. Um, I'd also like to uh, uh, formally invite those of you here for a wine reception uh, hosted by Dr. Stanley Bill and Sydney Sussex College, which is going to be outside at the Cloisters, uh, which is to the right out of here, yes? That would be in the Master's Garden, oh, excuse me. hosted by the Master of Sydney Sussex College, uh, right next door. So everybody uh, in the room is welcome to come one and join minute. us Sorry. for a glass of wine in the garden to close the day. So would you please again join me in... Uh, uh, everyone, everyone, of course, applauds the idea of wine, but I do want to, since I failed to introduce my guests earlier, I'd just like to thank once again Robert Frost, Frank Sisson, William Blacker, Karolina Vigura, Johann Petrovsky-Stern, Volomir Serokovsky, Pavel Kolva, and Mikola Rabchuk. Please thank them once again.
some audio on? Well, you can put some audio on. Isn't it efficient? Would you have a check for the audio? This is really sad because the audio is being more than seven pounds for any kind of audio bumping into it this morning thinking it's going to come off the wall but actually it's on chains. <laughs> So, some audio. Okay. Cool, okay. So, it is now 18.33. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Audio test for the web stream. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is an audio test for the web stream for the Cambridge Polish Studies event. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You're not bothering us, no, not at all. One, two, three. Pull down the PA feed. We'll see if that has any impact on it. Because there shouldn't be any delay. It's literally coming straight off the auxiliary, uh, not going through anything else and straight into the Teradec. So there shouldn't be any delays or reverbs or anything like that now. It's possible that there was a bit of reverb from the PA, but what do you think now? Does it sound a bit clearer? A bit cleaner? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. One, two, three, four, five. How's that sounding? One, two, three, four, five. Hmm? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just pull the PA down a touch, it's a little bit ringy there. That's coming off Orgs one and two. Yeah, Orgs 1 and 2. And Orgs 1 and 2 have a master control, which is just above where the main faders are. Uh, I think it's auxiliary 1 to 6. There's pots to control them. 